afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining on a Saturday. We really appreciate it. Um, so we just thought that um, now is the time of year where everyone's returning to medical school or physician associate uh, courses, and um, you know there's lots of freshers fair events going on. I think we just thought it'd be quite a good time to uh, have a bit more of an informal webinar where we kind of run through some things that we um, kind of within biomedicine think are useful things that you can get up to. Um, I, I will use the term medical school, but please, uh, if you're a PA or PA student watching, uh, hopefully some of this is um, uh, transferable. So, um, plan for today, hopefully keep it to about 45 minutes, and um, I'll be running through how you can get the most out of your clinical placements, some ways that I find really useful to study, because you don't have to uh, follow them, uh, some resources that can be quite helpful, and then some of the other things that we kind of deem as the extracurricular stuff like audits, leadership, research publications. And then really what I want to do at the end is a Q&A. So um, if you have any questions throughout, stick them in the chat or just like note them down on your phone, but I'll, I'll try and answer all of them at the end, okay? So um, I'm happy for you to kind of ping the chat as we go along. Um, so uh, without further ado then, we'll just get started straight away. So in terms of clinical placements, I think they can be a bit of a minefield. Um, it often feels like you kind of show up a bit like some deer in the headlines, not really sure about what's going on. Even when you're a final year on a new placement, it can feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, and in terms of being able to maximize your enjoyment of the placement, maintain that keen enthusiasm that we associate with students and being able to kind of prosper as an individual can often be affected by burnout, so going too hard too quickly. Um, this idea of having a difficulty when forming your professional identity, so going from a preclinical student or even an A-level student into the clinical world and struggling with that adaptation. Um, not being prepared, um, so rocking up on day one, not having a clue what to do, still having to sort out accommodation, all that kind of thing can affect it. Um, comparing yourself to others, you, you might have had a morning that was kind of there and someone will come back and say, oh, I have the best teaching with so-and-so, or I got to see this, and you immediately feel a bit downtrodden. Um, when it's not clear what you're expected to do, um, and then also just the stress. So I, I remember particularly in final year, going to placement and finding it so stressful the whole time I was thinking, I need to be at home, I need to be revising for my exams, what, what, what am I doing? Um, and so recognizing that all of these things can affect your placement really important because then you know that actually what you're feeling is probably quite normal. Um, so what we've done is we've put together nine kind of hot tips that we think if you just kind of keep them in the back of your head when you know you're on sort of week seven or week eight of like a 20 week term, you can revisit these tips and say, okay, how can I kind of um, reinvigorate myself and um, feel like I'm starting anew. So the the one of the ones that I think is quite important is um, trying to find a person, not an experience. Um, now, obviously, this differs from university to university depending on what they instruct you to do. But in general, if you've got a week where you're just allocated to a ward, try and find on day one or day two a, a doctor, you can be a consultant, a registrar, or a junior, and say, Do you mind if I tag along with you today? Don't just go, Oh, I'm going to be here for the ward round and jump around all over the shop. It can be a little bit you know, uneasy. But if you find a person and you say, can I be your person today? Can I shadow you? Um, you're far more likely to get lots out of it. And um, you'll begin to see also what that doctor or that PA actually does. Um, so it's important to kind of shadow all the grades. So over time, you'll kind of build up a bit of an idea of what, what to do. And following on from that, if you find yourself attached to a junior doctor that shows even the remote amount of interest in you, then stick to them, okay? If they're thinking to teach, um, just tell them. You say, look, I've actually had a really good day today. Um, I think it could be because you have, you know, uh, spent some time with me. Is there any opportunity for me to come and find you again? Now, they might say, oh, actually, I'm not on the ward the rest of the week. It doesn't matter. You could say to them, well, well can, I, can I join you for whatever you're doing? Um, you know, junior doctors, the majority of us are somewhere between 23, 24, and 28, like for the kind of foundation year level. Um, we're essentially your peers, so you shouldn't feel any kind of awkwardness 
letter saying, look, here's my number, perhaps we could WhatsApp. Um, you know, I know if the student did that to me, I would see it as an initiative and be more than happy to kind of uh, spend more time with them. And that has happened. So I'm saying this with first hand experience. So yeah, definitely find the doc junior doctors that showed interest and uh, follow them. And consider mixing up your timetable a little bit. So um, this is all, again, very university dependent and depends on how strict your uh, placement is with sign offs and, you know, punctuality and stuff. But if there's a way that you can say, well, look, um, next week, instead of me coming in at 8 a.m. every day, making it to about 1 p.m. and then fatiguing after the ward round and just going home, perhaps I could mix things up a little bit. Perhaps I could come in on an afternoon on Friday rather than the morning. You can sync it around your teaching. Um, but just keeping things a little bit fresh will stop you stop that sort of um, monotony kicking in. And also, doing five 8 a.m.s in a row is natural, no matter what level you are. So, you know, that, that, that's pretty tough. So if your university is happy for you to kind of mix things around and your kind of placement tutors are as well, then, then try it. Because you can also then say, well, look, instead of coming in on Monday, perhaps I could do a night shift and just see how that, that works. And it's, or, or a twilight even, so just some after hours. And it's all these kind of experiences that will uh, open your eyes to the kind of the wider role of the healthcare professional and what they do outside of the normal eight to five. Um, and it also means you're less likely to be vying for the attention because there'll just be less medical students around in those hours. So definitely kind of have a think about if that's something you could um, uh, seek out. And again, feeding back into point two, if you've met a really enthusiastic junior doctor, say that to them. Say like, you know, I haven't got much going on this weekend. What if I missed Thursday, Friday, and you know, just studied and then I came in and joined you on the Saturday and said, great. So there's some things to think about. Um, I think it's also important to say if you can shadow various healthcare professionals, that would be really, really useful. So um, some universities are really keen on doing this, so they'll give you a nursing day, they'll give you a day with the pharmacist. Uh, my university, not so much. Um, so I would definitely, if you get the opportunity to, to seek this out, um, just so you know when you become a junior doctor what all the other roles involve, um, and you have a bit more of an understanding of their stresses and what they would find frustrating um, coming from you when you're the doctor or the PA. Um, so the, the, ne the next two I'm going to kind of talk about together. So this idea of passive versus active participation in um, uh, clinical placements. So um, going to a clinic and sitting in the corner or, you know, being an extra pair of shoes on a ward round is absolutely fine. It's the bread and butter of what we think about when we think of being on placement. Um, and you do observe a lot and you get a lot out of observing. Um, but you need to kind of think, especially as you're becoming for fourth and fifth year medical students, about how you can slowly be transitioning into a more active role within your um, placement. Now, some um, placements are designed to allow you to do this if you have like an acute module where they will encourage you to class, and um, whereas others don't so much. So trying to balance, even from the beginning, this opportunity to go and clerk a patient and, you know, be the doctor for, for um, you know, a half hour segment, even if this involves going to see a patient that's already been clerked, just to practice your own history taking and examination skills, or if you're actually in A&E or AMU and you're saying, well, look, do you mind if I go and see a patient that's not been seen yet and I will report back to you? All of this kind of requires a little bit of confidence, a little bit of initiative, but once you've done it once or twice, you'll fall into it and you'll think, actually, I can do this all the time. And then the final point there is the clinical skills is every junior doctor will love it if a medical student rocks up and says, hey, you got any skills that need doing on the ward? Can I help with doing some floods, doing some cannulas? Um, you know, even if the first few, you say, well, look, do you mind if you shadow me? And then after I can be, you know, come later in the week and be a bit more independent. Everyone's going to love that, including yourself, because you'll get those signs. And then kind of the final three things to say is the more time, and, I, and you'll have heard this from your, your tutors before, but the more time you spend in placement, the easier you are going to find revising from a book. So I'm currently preparing for some postgraduate exams, and I'm finding the revision process so much easier than I did when I was a final year. And the simple reason is every time I'm reading a little written vignette, I'm thinking, what was, you know, I, I've seen a patient coming with what did I do then, or what did I not do, and therefore 
regret. And it's so much easier to map your written learning against a physical thing. So if you see a patient with, you know, AL amyloidosis, speak to them, ask them, do they have any, you know, strange um, stories about their, their condition, anything to really jog your memory so that when you go away and learn AL amyloidosis, you've got space to map to that condition. And I can't stress that one enough. Um, this next one, you can take this one or leave it, but sometimes less is more. And what I mean by this is if you've had a really good morning, you've had some fantastic teaching, you managed to get two cannulas signed off, did a wicked history, been, you know, been in, really felt like you've um, been accepted into the, um, the team, perhaps call it a day then rather than lingering on the ward and things peter out and the doctors are trying to get on with their jobs and then you kind of leave on a bit of a low. It's sometimes it is just best to say, well, look, I've had a really fantastic day today. I can now go home with some energy and perhaps do some written work or even something extracurricular um, and actually get a really good, you know, felt like I've got a really good day after. Again, I have to stress that if your university is one that requires you to do sign in, sign out, then this might not work so well. Um, but my university it was very much a kind of you were independent in what you did, and I often would follow this less is more approach. And then the final one really is consistency. So if you have been assigned to a ward for four weeks, rocking up as often as you can across a long period of time will help cement you as a member of the team. People will, will remember you and are more likely to throw you a bone and say, oh, hey, look, I can, I can trust you, you can come and do this. Um, it gives you an opportunity to follow up on patients that you saw from day one to day 10. Um, and, I, I, you know, even if it, you're on a place that where you get moved to a different ward every week, actually just spending an afternoon just before you leave, popping back to a ward you were on the previous week, saying hello to the doctors and saying, hey, like when I was here last week, I had a really good time, there was a patient who might have seen them. Um, it's just little things like that that, you know, if you've got it in your arsenal, as, oh yeah, maybe, maybe I could do that today. Um, it just stops that feeling of getting to placement and then going, I've got nothing to do. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of the nine hot tips, I think, um, of, in terms of clinical placement. And I won't, I won't bang on about those anymore unless people have got questions at the end. So moving on to study skills then. So we'll have a, a bit of a, a generic chapter and then something a bit more specific. So I think the obvious thing to say is everyone does study differently. Um, there are, of course, the classic um, uh, tools that people talk about. So um, being able to literally you know, cover your eyes, shut your eyes, not look at a resource and try and actively recall as much as you can about a topic is a proven way to um, commit something to memory. And the other thing that is really good at committing to memory is spaced repetition. So doing something on day one, day 10, day 30, and two months down the line, you will hopefully have remembered it because you've, you know, it's essentially a, a thing of forming synapses. But there are some specific things you can do. So making notes, some people find that really, really useful. Flashcards or self-designed questions. This was something that I used throughout university, um, even for exams where perhaps it shouldn't have lent itself to them, like ethics exams. I used to make questions say, you know, give, you know, four negative arguments for assisted suicide or, or some, something like that. Um, just because that, that was a way that I really felt had helped to commit things to memory, and you can use it for anything. Um, reading books, some people just find it really, really good to just sit down with a textbook. Watching videos like this or YouTube videos, uh, even if you set them to kind of times two speed, um, so it feels like you're, you're being extra productive. And then the obvious one for, for exams is using question banks, um, of course, bite medicine being, being one of them. So that's some, some generic tips. And then um, before I go on to some specifics, I just wanted to mention some books. So everyone will use their own books. Everyone will tell you to use different books. And some people will say, don't use books at all. Um, I think don't bog yourself down with books. Um, it's so easy to take 10 out of the library and then just feel like, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed because I've got all of this. Plus I've got all of the resources that my university has got the virtual learning environment or Moodle or whatever they use. Um, so I've just put on here four kind of series of books that I personally use and would hand on heart um, endorse them. I'm not being paid to say this. I 
which I was, um, they are fantastic books. So the Oxford Handbook, I'm sure we all know the cheese and onion, the Oxford Handbook for Clinical Medicine, they have one for surgery, they have one for, um, I think medicine and surgery is together actually, I think they have one for specialties, they have one for GP, they have one for everything. Um, and I, I think they're fantastic just to have with you on the ward, particularly the cheese and onion. So when you're at, like, you know, seeing a patient, you can quickly flip through and, you know, learn what Langerhans cell histiocytosis is so you don't, you know, get grilled by your uh, consultant. The next one down is without a doubt the best book that I ever read at medical school. It's called Oxford Clinical Cases in Medicine and Surgery. It's a red and white book and it's fantastic. It's bite-sized, easy to follow, essentially runs through the top 25 to 30 presenting complaints that you should know as a clinician. And each chapter is organized by that, by a presenting complaint. Um, it talks you through what differentials you should automatically be thinking about, what investigations you should you know, talk to, uh, kind of order to, to rule them out, things to ask in the history and exam, which are really useful for OSCE prep. And it slowly leads you down to the final diagnosis, and then it gives you a bit of information about it. So I cannot endorse that one enough, especially if you're new to clinical studies. So if you're a new um, first-year clinical student, this book, I cannot stress how good it is. The next one down, um, there's lots of kind of knockoffs, but the, the official series is called 100 Cases In. And essentially, it will just go through each specialty. So you can get the Obs and Gynae book, the Pediatrics book. And this is called 100 Cases In, very short vignettes, a bit like you'd get in an exam. You can read through and um, uh, basically practice what your differential would be as you're reading it, what investigations you want. And then it's got a list of questions underneath each, each, underneath each case um, that you can uh, test yourself on, essentially. I found this book, particularly for my specialties year, absolutely fantastic really really good even I, I found one of the books a week before my revision and just decided to commit one day to do the 100 cases in pediatrics and i didn't regret it at all i learned loads consolidated what i already knew big fan and then the final one is this uh, book called Hutchinson's clinical method it's very useful for learning your OSCE examinations obviously loads of fantastic websites out there now that have them all you know videos you can watch and print out PDFs, but you can't go wrong with this book. It's got loads of interesting signs, beautiful images, um, and yeah, I was a big fan of this. So, as I say, those are the four book series that I would recommend. I'm not going to shove any more uh, down here. And then, so one other thing that someone said to me in my penultimate year of med school that really kick started me to change my revision approach was the following. So I'll start in the left-hand column, this conditions approach to, to revision. Um, essentially, this is where and I, the majority of us will do this, organize our revision by specialty. We'll learn cardiology, we'll learn respiratory, we'll learn gastro. Um, and then within each one, we'll learn these set diagnoses and the conditions, you know, everything we need to know about them. As I said, the more common approach, the way most textbooks, including the White Medicine Online textbook, lay out their revision, um, and it's really helpful because it, it you know, forces you to learn the condition in a lot of detail. So if you ever meet someone with a condition, you know everything about it. Now, the presenting complaint approach is the road less traveled. This is essentially where you organize your revision by presenting complaint. Now, that Oxford um, Clinical Cases book that I was talking about earlier is a fantastic tool for, for revising. Um, so, for example, if you organize your revision by chest pain, you can then work out, you know, note down all the uh, differential diagnoses, the appropriate investigations that you would give, the management. Um, and this is really um, a much more clinically oriented approach. This is how you would approach a patient if you were in the A&E department or parking or, or called to see a patient on ward cover, um, because you don't know what the diagnosis is immediately. You're faced with a presentation. So it's super helpful for preparing you for being a doctor or a PA. Um, it's also, and I think you'll forget this, this is how the exams are designed. The majority of the questions will be an X person presents to ED with X. And 
you know, it's not, you know, they don't present with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, they present with, you know, respiratory liver signs. So knowing the presenting complaint is, is crucial. The issue is you kind of need to do both. Um, so I've organized my revision entirely at the left, and then about a month before my penultimate exams, someone mentioned this, this strategy to me, and I went and redid my notes, just left my notes as they were and restarted, again, organizing by presenting complaints, feeding all of the knowledge from my previous notes into it, which was kind of an active process of revision anyway. Um, and I just found it very, very useful. Um, so yeah, consider, you know, if this, even if one person in the audience tonight is watching and thinking, actually, that's a great idea, I'm gonna go do that, then I'm happy. Um, but it can be a really uh, effective way of just stopping that sort of monotony of, right, I've done rest, now I'm to cardio, right, I've done gastro, now I'm to neurology. So uh, there you go. Um, and another thing that can be quite useful, especially if you're on the move a lot, uh, or taking buses or you know, uh, taxis to and from placement, is making a little table on your phone. And you can use various apps to make these tables. Um, and just having a very short bit of prose for each condition or disease, um, and then a couple of key facts about each one that you can just sit, sit there and, and test yourself. You don't need any fancy apps or any paid apps to create this. You can actually just sit there, and when you're at home, you can, you can add to this list. Um, and this is something that I found, found quite useful. So moving on to OSCEs then. Um, so in terms of revision tips, OSCEs are something, OSCEs and ISCEs, they're something that um, are characteristically uh, underprepared for compared to an SBA. Especially at my university, people would put hours and hours and hours and hours of work into their written exam, and then a week before the OSCEs, be like, oh, I'll start revising for those now. Definitely not the way to go about it. Don't do it alone. Definitely prepare with people, okay? Um, design some stations for each other. Know what your exam is going to involve, and then create some stations. Pretend to be a patient. Pretend to be the examiner. And have someone pretend to be the candidate. Take it in turns and just practice, practice, practice. The reason I say rehearse with peers is some people like to do it alone because they think it's a bit cringy or they're a bit embarrassed, but ultimately on the day, you're gonna be doing it in front of a, uh, an examiner, you're gonna be doing it in front of an actor or a real patient, and you can't be cringing then. And the more you do it in front of people, the more normal the process becomes. Um, likewise, when you are seeing patients in the hospital, um, Sometimes it can be quite useful, even though if it wouldn't necessarily be the way you would talk to a patient in real life, just practicing your OSCE manner and say, you know, doing the whole wash hands, good afternoon, my name is, da da da. Um, just sometimes it can it can help um, with you know normalize what you have to do in the, in the OSCEs. And you know, it's critical that you know the format of your exam. So lots of um, generic resources out there will tell you that the station is 12 minutes or eight minutes or 10 minutes know what it is for you so you can refine your rehearsed exam to the length that needs to be. Know if your uh, OSCEs are going to have vivas in them, um, so you can prepare that kind of question and answer format that the examiner might, might ask you. Um, and with vivas, all I can say really is make sure that your answers are as short and sweet as possible, because the examiner can always ask more from you, but if you ramble on on question one and you run out of time, you don't score any points on the subject. Um, most OSCEs will now have a couple of um, sort of slightly alternate stations like a radiology or a dermatology station. Um, for these, me personally, what I used to do was create PowerPoints that I would add to throughout the year. So for radiology, I would have, oh, I still have a PowerPoint that had about 300 slides on it. And on each slide, there was a different radiograph or CT finding, or ultrasound finding um, that on the subsequent slide has the answer. And so as I go through my year and I discover more and more about x-rays or you know, learn something on clinical placement, I go home, Google x-ray of thumb printing, get the image, put it on my PowerPoint and slowly build it throughout the year. So that's something you can do as you go. It's a really good way to learn radiology for both the SBAs and the OSCEs, but particularly for the OSCEs was a really good way 
that spot diagnosis section as well as kind of describing a radiogram. And the same for dermatology. Okay, Derm there's loads of fantastic germ websites out there that have some really good images of, um, of skin that you can add. And it's the same thing again image followed by a subsequent slide with the information so you can kind of do a flashcard like checking. Um, can't stress how good that was for my learning. And even now, going back to post grad exams, um, I've got all of that material ready to, to learn from, which is useful. So then on the day, it's the obvious stuff. I won't really uh, bore you with this stuff. So being well rested, getting to the exam plenty of time. Now, this is a bit of a um, contentious uh, area at the moment. I think it's a Newcastle student uh, who um, recently underwent quite a, a negative experience from the examiners who felt that they weren't addressed uh, appropriately, which was completely unfair. Um, I think just in general, we were always told at university, dress as you would on the ward, okay? So professional attire and um, you'll have no issues. Um, don't overdo your practice in the morning. If you've got an afternoon session, there is nothing worse than practicing 12 scenarios with a peer and then going and having to do another 12. The OSCE is a bit of a marathon exam and um, you need to be kind of fresh for it. So don't you know overdo that that morning. And whatever, you know, they are quite anxiety inducing for some people. So if you think that you're someone that will struggle, know what kind of calming strategies work for you. If that involves taking an iPod with some headphones to play some music before you go in, um, or just being on your own for a little bit, then, then do that. Fab. Okay. In terms of, just before I speak about all the extracurricular stuff, um, just like to take a moment just to speak about bike medicine and how it can be used to help your revision. So um, if you're joining us, you've probably been to one of our webinars before and I'm assuming you have a, a login. So I'm sure you all know that we have a question bank and an online textbook. Um, we also have a load of different videos on some um, uh, key topics uh, that we continue to add to. So um, you can kind of access them through the app or uh, on YouTube um, to kind of get an hour or so teaching on particular topics. And there's a load of high yield SBAs that are thrown in there as well. So um, pretty useful stuff. In terms of our textbook, I'm just going to screenshot here. So they're organized exactly the same. They always have pathophysiology, epidemiology, features, investigations, management, etc. cetera. Um, and then you can open up each one. So here the pathophysiology section is opened up. We've got some nice information. Um, the high yield bit highlighted in bold um, that you can uh, either do before or after the question bank. And for each textbook, the associated questions are linked straight next to the textbook. So you can decide to read the textbook and then test yourself on whether or not you uh, took in all the necessary details. And here's an example of a, kind of a, a bit more of a tricky uh, question related to Wilson's disease. Um, so, you know, what features are most likely to experience, is a patient with Wilson's most likely to experience? Um, so, if you get it right, you'll get a little green tick and it will give you the explanation as to why. But you can also tick all the others to find out why whatever answer you were thinking is wrong, which is a really useful thing and it's not used in all um, question banks out there. So, it can be a really nice way to consolidate your learning and not only be like, yes, I got that right, but also why is the best answer. Um, and, you know, we've got all the major uh, specialties highlighted here. So if, if you know, um, balance is something you think is useful, we'll be giving out a 40% uh, discount code specific to this webinar um, at the end uh, that you guys can, uh, if you've only got a free um, trial so far, can upgrade to premium with. So uh, moving on to supracurricular activities. So extracurricular being, you know, sport, socializing, all that stuff, supracurricular stuff being anything on top of your um, medical uh, degree that helps with, you know, uh, applications and stuff. So um, essentially the, the supracurricular things you can kind of divide into research, education and teaching, leadership, and then team working things. Um, and the reason I've put this up, this is direct from the um, UK FPO application uh, website. Um, so if you're someone that's thinking already about applying to the 
Specialised Foundation Programme, which was formerly known as the AFP, or the Psychiatry Foundation Fellowship. Um, you might need to write some white space questions about these various things. And certainly beyond um, F2, you'll have to start doing this quite regularly. So already knowing at quite an early stage of your medical degree, what kind of areas they expect you to have kind of expanded upon um, within your um, spare time is uh, really useful because you can start to kind of plug the gaps. Um, so it's not just at the UK FPO level, this is the IMT scoring grid and you can see at the bottom here, they want to know your undergraduate degrees, your postgraduate degrees and uh, you know, publications, teaching, QI things, it's always the same. That's for IMT and then uh, CST, it's the same as IMT plus about some specific things here. So, you know, if you've already worked out what you want to do, go onto these websites, look at what their, you know, their requirements are to make sure you're a top scoring candidate um, and just begin to collect points. I, it's, it's a horrible truth, but the application is just a bit of a points game. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's the phrase, don't hate the player, hate the game, unfortunately, where, um, you know, knowing that, for example, with a surgical, that you need to go and be involved in 15 cases, knowing that from your fourth year, you might be able to go and tell a surgeon, look, I'm really looking to be able to get a couple of cases during this placement. Is there any chance you'll help me and sign me off? Um, so don't leave it all to the last minute. Be prepared and you will be successful. So moving on to audits and leadership. So these kind of um, areas that will uh, help boost your applications. So both audits and uh, quality improvement projects um, essentially are there to make departmental, hospital-wide or national changes for the better. Um, you need to do it during your foundation years. I didn't actually know this, but to actually pass F1 and F2, you have to have had some involvement in an audit or a QIP. So it's important to know about. Um, but actually doing a good one can be very helpful in your future applications. So an audit is essentially where you compare how, let's say, your department is doing against particular standards. So you could use a NICE guideline, you could use a specific specialty guideline, and you'll say, so for an example, one I did was um, all patients who come in with acute coronary syndrome should have their lipids checked. Um, so uh, assessed, are the, is this happening in, say, a two-week period, how many of those patients got tested? You get a number, a percentage. Then what you do is your PDFA cycle. So you make a change. You say, well, what's my change going to be? I'm going to um, do a teaching session to all the junior doctors, reminding them to uh, you know, request lipids. Um, I'm also going to change our junior doctor handover sheet so it says it along the top. And then I'm going to study to see whether or not my impact, you know, my, my intervention had any impact. And if not, or if it did a bit, I can do further changes and begin the process again. And to score maximum points, my understanding is for IMT at least, it's now three full cycles, which is actually quite a lot and can, can take a lot of time, um, of the same audit. Um, and I think for surgical, it's more about being able to present your audit at a particular um, you know, departmental meeting or national conference or something. Compare an audit to a QIP. So a QIP gives you a bit more breathing space. Uh, it's less helpful for um, uh, you know, point scoring, but actually will be really good to talk about in an interview. Um, so it might just be that you noticed um, a certain lack of morale amongst your team. And so you decided to create a um, uh, weekly Wednesday pizza day or, you know, something that's a little bit more subjective, um, but can actually have a major impact or change on your department or hospital wide or, or nationwide. Um, that tends to be the difference. Um, I would say work together. Okay, this, for audits, there's a lot of data that needs to be analyzed. If you do it as a group of three or four, you each take a certain number of patients, it can make it a very, very simple thing to do. And the final thing to stress is keep your audits simple. Test one or two things. So for me, I was checking lipids and I was checking HbA1c. Were they being checked for patients coming in with ACS? I used my NICE guidelines to find things that they recommend 
patients should be getting, and it's as simple as that. You can actually go on to various conditions, go onto a nice website, and look, just look through the guidelines and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, check to see whether all patients who have uh, consolidation on a chest, chest X-ray are getting a post uh, chest X-ray review later down the line, so things like that. So that's audits and QIP. In terms of leadership, um, there are three perceivable benefits to getting involved as a leader within a society or something. Um, firstly, is you get to meet new people, you get to join a new hobby, get, get a new hobby, a new activity. Um, for those who don't necessarily feel that they are natural leaders or don't think that you know, it's, their, it's where they like to be, it can put you outside your comfort zone and really test yourself um, and teach you some valuable skills. And the final one, there's no getting away from it, it is a recognized CV booster and gives you points on an application. So some examples of what you can do. Um, so when you get to foundation year, every single a deanery, will, uh, a deanery and uh, trust will have foundation representatives where you can basically feed back what the thoughts and feelings are of a particular F1 cohort to the higher uh, management and um, consultants so that they can enact changes. You can join the mess committee, um, which is more for social things. You can join a university society, and this is something you can do when you're at med school or PA. Um, and you can also then go for a national position. So you can apply to be a BMA representative, a, a member of the Royal College uh, representative. Um, and of course, the national uh, positions tend to be a bit more competitive and carry a bit more um, uh, credit at application. But they're all fantastic. Um, to get those top two benefits that I've outlined there. Um, again, one thing I would say, and this is something that I definitely learned the hard way with, is that with leadership, less is more. Being the person that signs up to every single society means you're not going to be able to commit all your time and effort to those societies. It's far better to be on one, maybe two, have an active role in it for even over a year, and you can slowly change position and work your way up, even to you know, become a president of a society. Um, but have all of your energy and enthusiasm thrown into it so it makes a difference. And the application scoring things are slowly changing to reflect this, but they're saying we don't just want um, students that have got a role, they, we want them to have had a role and to have made lasting impact. And that's something they start with, starting to specify, which is really important. You don't just get these people who sign up to everything, but then once they've got the accolade, dump it, which I'm sure we can all think of. Uh, individuals who, who do this approach. So then research and publications. Well, I'm getting fairly near to the end now because I do want to uh, you know, throw it open to the floor um, and uh, do um, a QA. and a uh, So SSC, Student Selected Component. Um, most universities offer these, so it's a part of your placement or a complete placement where you're just allocated time to pick a specific research module or a specific clinical rotation that you really want to do and want to get the most out of. And I would say an SSC is a fantastic time to start to build your research portfolio. All you have to do is ask, okay? If you go to, let's say you want to be a budding oncologist, you go and find the oncology team, you say, look, I'd really like to come chat with you. I'm, I'm really keen to do any research that you're currently working on, I'm happy to be a data monkey, I'm happy to do write-up, I'm happy to do anything. If you tell them up front you are looking to get published, there's no harm in being honest, okay, they'll respect that at all. But you can also tell them, actually, I want to work out if I want research to be a major component in my career, um, and therefore I do want to build some research skills. I want to know the difference between wet lab, dry lab, I want to um, learn some basic statistics, um, the actual process of submitting a paper, of attending a conference, all these things. And SSC is a really good time to do it. Likewise, finding yourself a mentor um, who's able to guide you through those processes of getting published, uh, submitting posters and uh, oral presentations. They might be the ones to say, look, you know, you need to know about this, this conference that's coming up. That, that research project we did, that audit we did, we could potentially submit it there. Um, and again, finding a mentor, some people it comes to them very easily, um, others not so much. It is just a case of if you ever meet someone that you feel resonates with you, just
just talk the way you think, then just ask them. Say, look, is there any chance that like I can be involved with you in another capacity that we could work on something together, show some initiative, make some suggestions. Don't be, you know, don't relinquish your responsibility to them. Just say, this is what I'd like to do. Do you know either yourself or someone else that will be able to help you get there? Um, and people will respect that. In terms of being an independent researcher, um, there are, I'm going to highlight now some specific examples of how you could potentially get published at medical school. So all of the below things are examples of types of publications that you could get. So if you see an interesting case um, on the wards or in a clinic, ask the patient for permission to write it up, even try and get yourself some written consent. Mention to the doctor that you're with that you'd like to do it because they might be able to, to you know, help you. Um, and you know, write it up, write why it's an interesting case, and find a journal to submit it to. Um, audit publications, if you've done a particularly interesting audit, you might be able to publish it or at least get it presented at a conference. Cohort studies, and this was something that I did in my final year, um, which I'll show you in a second, but um, essentially going through some um, patient, a patient list of a particular um, time point um, to look at, in this case, it was looking at um, obesity rates in children, um, finding out some interesting things about one cohort and then looking back at a different cohort in the same population you know, 10 years prior and looking at the difference. This is something you could do on a GP placement um, and quite easy to get published. Letters to the editor. So most, um, this is particularly for medical education journals, but um, other journals offer it as well at student level, is writing an opinion piece in response to someone's publication. So 400 words or so um, uh, publication, you essentially submit, you say, you know, dear editor, I read with interest, you know, what so-and-so et al wrote the other day, um, here's my take on it. Um, I think for um, foundation program, I'm not entirely sure if that's what the editor no longer count, um, uh, but you'd have to look into that. But they are, uh, you know, a form of publication and they do, most of them feature on PubMed. Um, I have to excuse me, our son has just decided to come out. Um, review articles are, and systematic reviews, I'll show you an example of each of those in the next few slides. So in terms of getting advice for publishing, speak to your peers. If you know someone that's got published, speak to them, say, look, how did you do it? I'd love to know. Um, and speak to students in the higher years for advice because they might know a little bit more. Um, one thing that I found quite useful is if you know someone's got published, Type their name into PubMed, look at what they published, and see, well, could I do that? Possibly, yeah. Um, see, see what journal they submitted it to, um, and see if they published it with a particular doctor that you could then contact and say, look, I've seen my, my friends got published with you, is there any chance we could write something up? Um, it's a really easy way you can just go away and, and have a look um, to, to try and boost your, your chances of publishing. I'm just going to quickly show you some examples of things that you definitely could do um, if you put your mind to it. So here's an example of a letter to the editor. I'm sure you'll agree it's not very long at all. Um, and I'll put these slides up um, after the session so you can have a bit of a read through in more detail. Um, this is an example of a case report. I haven't put the whole case report, just an, uh, an abstract, but essentially it's a summary of a case and then what the case felt, why it's interesting. Um, so it was an atypical presentation, essentially. Um, so that case report's a very, very doable thing to, to write up and publish. And also, you can very easily submit them to a uh, conference as well, which gets you points. Uh, this was a cohort study, so an analytical retrospective study looking at the prevalence of childhood obesity. Um, so essentially looked at a cohort 2019 and then looked at one 10 years prior and, and how uh, their ages, well, how the obesity rates have changed. Um, again, it's just about finding a journal that will accept you. You're not, you're not punting for nature here. Um, but if you've done a good quality, you know, uh, project that you know, you've learned something from and you think actually that, that, was, that wasn't half bad, I think that's worthy of getting published, then you can always try. Um, this is an example of a uh, systematic review. 
Um, so this is uh, my fiance. She's given me permission to, to show these. So um, essentially, look through all the um, uh, papers on a particular uh, topic and then analyzed each one in turn, saying their pros and cons, and then came to a conclusion at the end as to whether zinc should be used. Um, and again, she wrote a fantastic article on uh, personality disorders in black people. Um, again, a bit similar to a um, systematic review, but it was a bit a bit more like dissertation, so just a um, kind of a, a, a prose uh, discussion about um, the various literature that's out there. So loads of different types of things that you could get published, and I hope maybe someone's been inspired to actually think, yeah, this is something I could do. So before we go on to a Q&A, some final tips. Um, so maintain your portfolio as you go along, whether it's using an offline um, file, whether it's using a Google Drive, whether it's using anything, a Dropbox, keep your portfolio up to date. So if you get a certificate, save it, put it in there. Um, you can even organize your file by teaching, research, leadership, and put the various things in the various boxes. Just so later down the line, you're not thinking, oh God, where was it? It was in an email attachment somewhere. Just get good at, if you ever get something that is, um, you know, evidence of something good that you've done, just save it. Okay, don't, don't be a mug. Um, Twitter. So I have mixed, mixed opinions about Twitter, um, but there is a whole sphere of Twitter that's associated to medicine, med Twitter. Um, there's lots of funny things on there. There's actually lots of times that people have reached out and tweeted me directly, and we ended up, you know, chatting and, and uh, you know, networking. Um, so if it's something you have thought, oh, I'm not really sure about it, um, it's worth just getting it and following a few choice um, kind of med Twitter uh, pages just to see. Um, same goes for Instagram. There's some fantastic med influencers out there, and I'd also say that Bite Medicine has got uh, uh, an Instagram at Bite Medicine. That you Follow us on for some um, kind of bite sized uh, content. LinkedIn, I, not many people use LinkedIn as medics, but I actually think it's fantastic. I have had lots of wonderful experiences from going on LinkedIn, connecting with people, and you know, kick starting conversations, potential research projects. Um, it's a good way of networking amongst different universities to um, spread the word of a particular event you're running. And despite everything that I've just said for the last half an hour to 40 minutes, um, I would encourage you to take breaks. So for me, my one thing at university was my Fridays were sacred. So as long as I didn't have to go in, I would take Friday off every single week. And it would just be my time to do whatever I wanted. Um, which if you kind of keep something as that is the day that I do this, um, it's a lot easier to, to stick to. Um, and it does have, stop you completely imploding because it's not easy being a student, uh, especially during the last year. I can't, you know, uh, sympathise enough. Um, so, you know, finding that time to just chill out um, is really important. Um, and the final one is really make memories. You're at university still. Enjoy it. It's a fantastic time. Um, and, you know, I think Stephen Fry said university is everything outside of the lectures. So, um, you know, make sure you're doing all the fun things that Um, that is the end. Um, so this is the discount code uh, that you'll be able to use um, probably within an hour of this um, webinar finishing. Um, so please note it down back to placement for 40% off. Um, I am now very, very happy to take any questions that people have. Um, So if you, if you use the chat function or the Q&A function, I'll stick around for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, we can go from there. Um, so I can see there's a question there. Um, is there a reliable website where we can find out the points required for certain deaneries? So this I'm not really sure about. Unfortunately, I'm assuming, uh, Mohammed, you're referring to kind of cutoff scores for your EPM plus SJT. Um, I think the UK FPO, at least when I applied, did have um, a list um, for, uh, you know, I think it was either average score or cutoff score. 
for each of the deaneries. Um, so you can look at that on the UK FPO website. They definitely have it. It's in like an 80 page document. You've just got to kind of, uh, sort of screen through it. Um, does the discount code expire? Um, currently, um, we have no intentions to expire it. Um, so I think if you've attended this session, it will be running for at least um, a month or two. So um, if, you, if you don't want to spend it right away, that's fine. Um, you can always message us and say, look, would you, do you mind honoring it? Um, I don't want to do it this time. Um, so Naveed said, how do you balance between time on placement and revision? I find I spend time on clinics towards the teaching that I have, and when I finish, I'm tired, so don't do revision on the weekend or until the weekend. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a massive um, uh, issue, isn't it, really? And I think it is all about um, remembering that what you're doing during the day on placement is revision. I know sometimes it doesn't feel at high yield because you know you haven't learned the print and facts. Um, but one thing I found really useful was just getting a question bank up on my phone and saying to myself, right, if at the end of the day you've managed to do minimum of say 10, 20 questions, plus all the clinical experience you've had, you've still had a really good day. And that's what I used to say to myself. And then you know on the weekend could then do the slightly more book work heavy, question bank heavy, revision. Um, and obviously as you get closer to an exam, that seesaw balance goes to your tips in favor of the book work. Um, but yeah, it's just about remembering that all of it is, is helpful. Yeah, so I can see Zach's got a message up there about um, we're just trying to validate our back to place the discount. So um, if you if you want it all set up, then please message Zach at whitemedicine.com. So any other questions at all about anything related to what we've spoken to today? If not, I will let you all get off and enjoy your Saturday uh, evenings. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Uh, what would you suggest is the best way to make yourself useful on place that make your intentions, e.g. sign ups required known early on or weight loss use? Ah, so I think you'll often get doctors who, when the medical student arrives, the doctor goes, well, what are you looking to get out of it? And that's really useful because then it's just a case you, you get the opportunity to be upfront. Um, I think um, it is a bit of a give and take. Unless you're someone that's particularly um, enigmatic, then sometimes it can be a bit jarring when someone comes up to you and just sort of announces exactly what they're looking to get without any kind of give or take. So it's quite it's quite nice, and it's it's it just shows good quality if you go up to doctors and say, "Look, um, anyway, I can be of use to you today." And if they say, "Oh, there's not much really going on," then you can say, "Okay, well, specifically, I'm looking to do this, this, and this." Is there any opportunities for that today, tomorrow, or this week? And they might be a bit more, you know, uh, you know, able to, to offer. I think ultimately just remember that, you know, they're, they're you in between one and three years' time, so you, they're not big and scary. Um, Mohammed, did you use Anki for clinical studies? No, I did not. Um, I have, however, started using it for um, my postgrad exams. Um, I just used good old fashioned PowerPoint. Because I'm old school and I literally just would do alternate slides, questions and information on one and then the answers on the other. So no, I didn't. Um, but I think you know resources like Anki and other ones that allow you to share your notes between uh, uh, students is, is fantastic and should be a really good way to, um, to revise. Uh, in hindsight, would I use it? <laughs> uh, Zach saying he thinks it would be cool if we can show those PowerPoints. Um, all right, we, uh, the, well, maybe another time. Uh, in hindsight, would I use Anki? Um, uh, probably not. I think, in terms of my actual revision strategy, I was very happy with just note taking, and then we get close to the exams, question bank plus plus the PowerPoints. Um, I actually, I think I've saved all of those PowerPoints on a Google Drive, which is why I can't uh, uh, get them up right now, unfortunately. Uh, I can have a, I can have a quick look, see if we 
are able to. Um, let's have a look. I'll just stop that share now. No, unfortunately not. That's, I'm afraid not. Uh, by most and content is all of Richard's PowerPoints. Right, you've, 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 you've caught us. That is the truth. It all came from my PowerPoints. Um, oh, yes, I did lend them to Zach for his final. Um, yeah, so I mean, any, any other questions, guys, uh, that you, I, I just, I, I want to stress, to be honest, that this entire session has been opinion based mostly. Um, it's just things that I think are useful, that I found useful. Um, I don't want you to take my word as gospel um, because it's not. Um, and everyone does things differently. And you might have sat through and gone, this guy doesn't know anything, um, which is completely fine. You're entitled to that opinion. So, um, you know, if you didn't find it useful, um, I'd actually love to find out why. So feel free to email me um, and we can improve this session in the future. Um, but otherwise, I think if there's no further questions, um, I think I'll probably wrap it up there. Um, oh, we've got one more. How can you get more from a clinic so you're not just sitting and watching the doctor? Um, it really depends on the clinician. You meet some very, very strange clinicians in the clinic. Um, if you get the opportunity to arrive there a little bit early and say to them, oh, last time I was at a clinic, and towards the end, um, the doctor allowed me to examine the patient, um, or, uh, you know, between each case, the doctor did a quick like Q and A with me about about it. Um, I find that really useful. Is that a possibility? If they're a nice clinician and it's not too busy, they might have the time to do it with you. I think the issue is just being a service providing NHS. Um, they cram as many patients in as possible, and so most doctors do not have the capacity, the energy, um, or the foresight to think. Okay, not only do I need to get through this clinic and give excellent care, I also need to put on a performance for this student. And so oftentimes clinics can be a bit, you know, fly on the wall. Um, but if you, you know, if you do just say to them, look, if we're not too busy, can we talk about each case between, then, you know, it's, um, it can make it a bit more interesting. Um, and also, I think if you know that you're going to be discussing each case in between, it kind of forces you or encourages you to listen to what's going on a little bit more. Um, so, uh, yeah, that would be my advice for clinics. Yeah, Zach's saying don't, don't be afraid to, to not hang around for too long. Yeah. If, yeah, it's, well, this is why I said it's really, you know, good if you can get a question back on your phone or a little table like I showed earlier, so that if you've got these kind of waiting periods where you think, oh, I'll just wait 15 minutes more to see if this doctor's turning up, you're not sitting there idly, you're doing that sort of classical revision. Uh, and you know, treating it a bit more like a job where you've got a nine to five, and in those hours you do medicine, and out of those hours you cook and socialise with friends and you know, have, have a nice life. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's it. If there's no more questions, um, I'll let you guys head off slowly. Okay, take care, everyone.